I am so pleased to have a special guest with us today, I'm Stacey Walker um, As you saw from yesterday, with all of the, the dry lightning and all the fires, this is a very important topic. And it's so important that we have one of the uh, supervisors for the Fire Prevention Department in the City of Reno, Willie Sears, here with us today to talk about fire prevention. And um, we're so, give him a great big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Know that um, the documents uh, that he is going to talk about today are on our website at uh, equismanagement.com. It's under the events section of the PDF. It's a fire prevention guide. And um, he's also given me um, a little uh, flash guide with all of that information on it. So if you want to download load that today, you may. Um, I'll hand it over to him. Thank you very much. Thank you, and good morning. Thank you for coming out. Um, we don't do a lot of these programs anymore. We used to go out and meet uh, homeowners associations and uh, citizens advisory board, neighbor advisory boards. And because of staffing and honestly lack of interest, we haven't gotten into it. But with the wildland, uh, wildland fire season we've been having recently, there's a renewed interest. Uh, the first thing I want to talk to you guys about today is a term everybody throws out and very few people understand what it means. That's defensible space. Who's heard the term defensible space before? Okay, here's the misconception. Defensible space is not outside your fence. Defensible space is measured from your house out. Now, the reason we stress that is that most of the newer homes actually have the fuel that will burn them down right in their yard. Uh, how many remember the Collin fire several years ago? Washoff fire several years ago, a couple months after the Collin fire? I am the last person in the Reno Fire Department that actually did damage assessment on both fires. So I was with the state. We made a round to all 30 homes in each fire, a total of 60 homes. And I will tell you, with a few exceptions, none of them were burned by direct flame impingement. In other words, the wildland fire did not actually burn those homes down. What burned those homes down were embers. Now, a wildland fire, low running fire, normal wind conditions, burns low and has to directly contact the structure or the fuel that it burns. In a wind-driven event, and both of those were wind-driven events, the embers can travel ahead of the fire for about a mile. So when you go down to these, to these burn areas, we'd run, the fire ran mostly ravines. So we'd have some damage along the edges of the ravine. But we lost houses that were blocks away from the ravine and never were subject to that fire. There's one house in particular I'm going to tell you about in the Washoff Fire. As we got out of our cars, one of the houses started to look strange to us. There was light inside the house. Now, the power had been cut off. So we're like, why is there light in this house? So as we started to walk around the side of the house, we realized the light was sunlight. The house, all that was left of it, was the front wall in the front yard. Once you got to the side, you realized everything behind it had burned. Now this house was stucco. It was a newer construction. It had a tile roof. Everything about that house told us that house should have survived. But then we noticed planted in front of the house were junipers. How many of you have junipers around your house? And then we walked around to the burn side of the house. And I mean, when I say burn, I mean gone. Literally, it was gone. This, this looked like a movie set. The house was gone, we had a slab behind it, and along the side of the house were stubs of junipers that had burned. So we go around the back of the house. It's a beautiful two-tier patio behind the house. Great view of the mountains and the valley behind, Washoe Valley. And stubs of junipers along the sides. We get to the end of the two tiers, and we see a row, of, a couple of rows of junipers built, planted as fire bricks. Of course, the two, these are just stubs. The last row took us right back to the ravine the fire had ran. There's no fire damage outside this ravine, except the line of junipers that burned and brought the fire right to the house, and then burned the house down. <laughs> junipers, like all the other evergreen trees, burn hot. They burn intensely hot. Um, they're evergreen all the time. A lot of people don't realize that inside the body of the tree, the needles that don't get sunlight die. They're in there. You pull an evergreen and really pull it apart. You'll find brown needles inside that haven't fallen yet. 
So in a wind-driven event with embers, they end up blowing into that tree and then getting fanned by the wind. They cause that tree to catch on fire. Now, a good example is that tree right there. If we were in the open and that tree would catch on fire, I would have radiant heat I could feel all the way out here. Intense radiant heat. It would be almost too warm. There, we call them periods of gasoline. And so we have a program we call Dunk the Junipers. We like to get pulled up, get rid of them. Get them out from underneath your house, get them out from underneath the eave of your house. If you want junipers, put them 20 feet away from your house. So for us, landscaping is huge. So we have an organization we work with, it's the Cooperative Extension Institute from UNR. They have a, a website called livingwithfire.info. I highly recommend that you visit that website. One of the big programs they have, and one of the PDFs that's on the thumb drive that I have today, is called Be Ember Aware. There are things around your house, the eve of your house, uh, that can catch embers, hold them, open decks, the embers can blow up underneath, be fanned by a flame, get hot enough to ignite that structure. There's ventilation holes on the side of your eave. They have, by code, a quarter inch metal mesh screen. That's a super highway. Embers can shoot right on in. Nothing in your attic, be fanned, catch on fire. Uh, ember aware, living with fire, and the fire service recommend that you change those out for a smaller eighth inch or smaller metal mesh. You need the ventilation required by building code. The size of the mesh can vary. The minimum size that they require is the quarter inch, but you can go much, much smaller than that. It's, it's designed to keep varmints out, and we want to keep embers out. So there's a lot of things you can do for yourself. One of the uh, documents that I've already given to uh, Deborah uh, and is also in the thumb drive is uh, from uh, Washoe County Office of Emergency Management. Uh, if you go to readywasha.com, they have um, a copy of their emergency preparedness manual. It's going to talk about evacuations, checklists, that kind of thing. The fire department gets to weigh in on all your subdivisions before they were built. There's two ways in and two ways out of your subdivision. It's designed that way for a reason. You have two options to get out. If you're directed out one way, where you can come in the other way. The plan there is, you know you're one way in and out. When you're told to evacuate, you'll go that way. We will open that gate, we will come in the other way. The idea is to get a, a constant traffic flow so that we can actually, in some cases, take both lanes as outbound traffic to expedite the evacuation and still have a 20 foot fire access lane so we can drive in and out through our own entrance. So, Ember aware is important, vegetation is important. These are the first steps. These, will, these are how you will protect your house. When you go to livingwithfire.info, uh, uh, as you play around on the website, you'll find some photographs of a house down in Carson City. It was their pride and joy. It actually was the cover house on one, on, uh, one of the uh, editions of their Living With Fire magazine. And it's the, the picture that's on the magazine shows this house with an inferno behind it. But there's actually three pictures involved. The first picture is the house when an owner bought it. And it was a mess. It had an exposed deck, it had shrubs and all those other things. So the owner got a copy of Living With Fire, followed their advice, cleaned things up, closed up all the traps. The next year, the big fire ripped down into the Carson Valley. Took out the entire subdivision. It was a moonscape when the fire was done with it, except this one house. So the three fire, uh, the three picture montage is the house before the fire, the house during the fire, and the house after the fire. It survived. Everything else in the neighborhood got swept away, except this house. But again, no direct flame impingement. It was embers. It was all blown down. Now, if you live in a newer subdivision, there's usually some kind of landscaping around the back of your house, the sides that the homeowners association owns and maintains. That's part of your fire break. That's part of your separation from the wildland fire. But again, it only affects direct flame impingement, that low running, normal wind fire. It can't help us with the embers. So you need to clean up the house and get that ready. Now, in the event of an evacuation, it's always, it's always a hectic time. There are checklists available. How many of you are native to the Reno area? A 
Okay, neither, neither am I. <laughs> Glad to have at least one, one native Nevadan with us. Um, I come from a military family. I'm used to packing up and moving every couple of years. So we tend to keep important documents and things in one place because we pack them and move them every couple of years. Um, there's a checklist that will be on the, uh, on the website, also at uh, readywashout.com. They have some really good ones. Go through that checklist. Make sure that you have the things that they recommend you have in a portable way. They don't need to be kept in a briefcase, but they need to be kept in one area where you can grab them real quick and get out the door. But the big thing is to be prepared. Be prepared to move, be prepared to shelter in place. So if we take a little time, we clean up around our house, we get our house up or where, you either have to evacuate or you're going to be asked to stay where you are. Now, in fire events, we don't typically lose power, but you should plan on it. Have a radio with batteries so you can get emergency notification. Flashlights are good. Um, drinking water is important because if anything happens to a pumping station, or if you happen to live in an area that's being served by a well, it may lose power. So you should have a supply of drinking water. They tell you to figure about three days, and that's what the Washington County Office of Emergency Management recommends. Three days of food and water and medication. Cell phones are important. Now, if you can't evacuate, what we tell people in building fires is to call 911, call 911 and let someone know. The only fatality we had on the Washaw fire was an elderly woman who lived in a, a house on her daughter's property. She looked out, she didn't think it was that bad, she stayed. The house did not burn, but the fire was so bad, the smoke was so bad, she actually succumbed to carbon monoxide and poison. So again, when there's an evacuation notice, most of the time, they're voluntary. I recommend heating them if the fire is within a half a mile. But if it's within a half mile to a mile, especially a wind-driven fire, I recommend just going over to a friend's house that's out of the area. But take some important things with you. That's when you take your kit, put it in the car, drive it to a safe place. Uh, in, the, in the event of a seismic event, how many of you realize that we're almost as bad a seismic zone as San Francisco? Okay, we've had a lot of little shakers, but we could always get a big one. That food and water will come in handy. That's part of what we do in, in fire prevention. When I was hired, fire prevention actually was called community risk reduction. So the event of a, of a natural disaster of any kind, having a three-day supply of food and water is good because you may not be able to get it, have cash on hand, because ATMs may not work, credit card readers may not work, you may need to have some cash on hand. The question is essentially, does the fire department notify property owners, especially large vacant properties, that they need to clear the property? And the answer is sometimes. <laughs> there, there are a couple of mitigating factors. The first thing is, if it is actual wildland, unimproved in its natural state, we don't do anything with it. Um, it's because it's in its natural state. If we remove natural vegetation, it will be replaced much more quickly by cheatgrass. And cheatgrass is my, my starter fuel. It's not native, it's an invasive species. It grows like crazy. Many of you are aware of that, you've seen it. But that's my starter fuel. Not so much for the fires we've seen like last night. Those were lightning caused and those, those start fire, wildland fires all the time even without cheatgrass. <coughs> but it's for my human caused fires, my shooting fires, my off-road vehicle fires, my cigarette fires. Those are the ones that are where cheatgrass is my, chart, my starter fuel. Cheatgrass actually doesn't burn all that hot. It, it burns quickly. It's what in California they call a grass fire. Uh, it's funny because we drive the same type of wildland uh, fire engines that they do in California. In California they're called grass rigs or grass engines. We call them brush because of our different environments. Um, but if it's a uh, if it's natural, we usually don't do anything with it. It's considered native growth. Um, if it's on federal land, we have a lot of that around here, or federally regulated land. One of the complaints I get a lot from people that live on the north side of, of downtown Reno is railroad right-of-way. Railroad right-of-way is federally regulated. They know it. I can't even call and talk to a person. There's a, there's a number I can call and leave a voicemail and request that they clear the property. I have no authority on the railroad right of way. I have no authority on state property. 
And so if it's state-owned land, then I have to refer to the state fire marshal's office. They have the jurisdiction. Um, there are some agreements with tra power transmission lines. Usually, under the lines themselves and for a distance on either side, they keep it clean just because they need to, to operate and to repair it. Um, the one thing that I would uh, ask is how far out does the tall grass extend from your fence? It's at the, the back fence. Just right at the back? It goes, it goes, okay. Then apparently, uh, the cheap grass is a lot like our native growth, and this is one thing that I run into from time to time. Cheap grass and native growth love water. Up until last winter, our big fear was cheap grass because we had had three or four dry winters. Cheap grass is really unusual in that it won't fall down on its own when it dies. It stays standing up. It has to be crushed by snow. Once it's crushed by snow, we're done with that year's crop, and then we just deal with next year's crop. If we don't have snow, then every year we don't have snow. We have each year's crop plus the new year's crop. So up until this last winter, we were sweating a big ranging wildland fire. Now, cheap grass will run fast. It's not a hot burning fuel. It doesn't have a tall flame link. So we're not too worried about how it endangers the structure other than it lights other things on fire. But when you get a lot of it, you're going to get a hot running fire. So we were really thrilled to get snow this year, enough snow to crush the cheap grass. Then we got more snow. We knew what was happening. All the native vegetation started to grow again in the wintertime. People don't realize it, but it did. The sage started to grow back. All the other natural stuff started to grow. So at the beginning of the cheatgrass growing season this spring, we had all of our native vegetation was just as happy as it could be. But what's, what we're dealing with now is we have so much more of the native vegetation, which, like the juniper or the other evergreens, has a very flammable sap. It stores that moisture for the dry season, so it was ready to burn. And that's a, that's a common thing here. It's a natural cycle. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but some species of pine trees, their pine cones will not open until they've been subjected to several hundred degrees of heat. In other words, they've survived a fire. And the reason for that is the, um, the seeds will then fall into fertilized nutrient-rich mulch from the fire. So they intentionally do not start the next generation until after a fire. So where we view fire as destructive and threatening, nature views it as cleansing and renewing. It, the weak trees are burned, the parasites are destroyed, the ground is fertilized by a fire. So fire, fire is a double-edged sword. Um, in the wildland, our, the reason we jump on them so fast is if we lose that native vegetation, we also will then have cheatgrass to replace it. I went to a house fire once, lightning, lightning caused house fire. It was an in and out. The house had a small hole in the roof, small hole in the side, and no real fire where the lightning hit the house. What the lightning started on fire was the stuff that the people had stored in the attic. They went right through there and started that on fire. Um, so lightning can, is, is, is one of our biggest dangers around here. Uh, the thing that strikes me as odd in the fire service is that we don't require uh, the lightning arresters and the lightning rods that you see on the East Coast. That's the one thing that strikes me as odd here. Uh, but it's not in our code. Uh, the thing that people don't realize is that the fire code, the building code, are minimum codes. You can go way above what we require, but there's a minimum standard that we can enforce, and so that's where we're at. Those, those items don't fall under our building or fire code. That is a great point. The question is about your garage door in a power failure condition. Now, as we all know, they all have a little red handle. You pull it, it lets you push the garage door up. And the gentleman is absolutely right. During the Colin fire, many people evacuated their houses, and they left their garage doors up. Well, what do we keep in our garages? I mean, yeah, we store boxes, we keep cans of gasoline. What is the garage really designed and protected for? It's to park a car. It was never designed. The, the building code, or the, actually in this case, the International Residential Code, does not envision what we do with the garage. They, they said, oh, well, there are going to be two cars here. That's the only hazard. We're done. Uh, so in, in Collin, we actually did have homes that had, they had left the doors open, 
And again, embers blew in. There was no direct flame infringement. Embers blew in, got inside. The whirling winds fanned the embers. Another problem we have in the, with a large fire, even if there's no direct impinge, flame impingement, radiant heat can start your home on fire. It could start outside uh, sh uh, siding on fire. Vinyl siding will just curl right up, exposing whatever under it. But the thing people miss are their window treatments. <clears throat> if you have light fabric window treatments on your window, the radiant heat can ignite those. If you have another stuffed sofa up against the bay window, the radiant heat can ignite that inside your house. Even if the fire never gets close, if it's within about 10 or 15 feet and it's got enough heat, it will start things inside the house on fire. So we tell people, if you're evacuating the house, pull all your furniture away from the windows towards the middle of the room. Either take down or pull all the way to the side any lightweight <coughs> fabric uh, window treatments. Roll up your blinds. The room itself can absorb a lot of that heat. It'll take it in, it'll just it, it'll move through your house but if things are sitting right by the window, it'll hit that first. It'll raise that product's temperature. And that's how fire spreads, even in a home fire. It's not direct flame burning the, uh, the furnish furnishings. It's the furnishing, furnishings reaching a heat where they release a combustible vapor. That's what burns, is the combustible vapor. So if you, if you do have to evacuate, or even if you're staying, Pull everything away from the windows. If it's below window level and it's like a table, you're probably fine. But any fabric covered um, furniture that's up near the window, slide it away. Get the light draperies down. Usually your synthetic um, blinds are okay. But again, if you open it, it allows that heat to flow into a larger space instead of hitting that wall and building up heat. How many of you have touched your, your blinds when the sun's been shining on them? Same basic idea. When it fires much, relatively much hotter, much closer. So it can, it can raise the temperature of those blinds. So raise the blinds, pull the furniture away, let that heat just flow through your house. You have a question, sir. Yeah, uh, two questions. One, what is the process for if you have a vacant lot next to you and, um, and you know, you got an easement with a bunch of trees that easily go up in flames? Um, so what do we do? Do I go to the local Reno fire department? It's a much better process here in Reno. Uh, we have a, a, an ombudsman line for one of a better term. Uh, it's called Reno Direct. I'll give you a phone number. It's 334-2099. Now, that phone number will take messages, but if you leave a message, I'll call you back. You can also go to the City of Reno website, reno.gov, and you'll be able to find that Reno Direct. They do a chat, so if you're tech savvy and you like to do online chats, you can also send emails with pictures. Any complaint you have or any question, that's the way to get a hold of the right department. So if you call that number and you give us a location, it's going to be routed to two different agencies. This is why I recommend using Reno Direct rather than calling directly. It will go to the fire department and it will go to code enforcement. And we each approach the problem from two different directions. Now, they have a lot um, there are some conditions where we will intervene. We may not have them clear the entire lot, but we may have them clear 10 foot around the perimeter, and then a diagonal so we can drive through it. Um, again, we don't want to strip a lot, we don't want to go down to bare earth, but we do want to have a distance yeah. between your property and the fire load. I get a lot of questions from people that live adjacent to Bureau of Land Management and Forest Service mm -hmm. land, and the tumbleweeds. Um, it's going to depend on who owns the property, if it's Bureau of Land Management or a federal agency, I'm powerless. I, I can't do anything with it. If it's uh, privately owned, then I have the ability to notify the owner. Um, I will tell you that, uh, and this is, this is not to diminish our duty in this situation, to give you an idea where we stand with our workload. We have seven fire inspectors that handle the entire city of Reno. Um, we just recently did a uh, study based on a new NFPA standard, and in order to handle all the work that is technically assigned to our division, we need 29. 